Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WIPB-TV and Indiana Public Radio at Ball State University. Today, we are chatting with Jennifer Johnson, Executive Director of the Muncie Symphony Orchestra. Jennifer has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Mark. Thank you for having me. Symphonic music, instruments that were developed 100, 200, 300 years ago. Mm -hmm. Talk about the relevance of these instruments this music, this amazing immersive experience for audiences today. The symphonic orchestral experience is for everyone. And you bring up a really good point. A lot of uh, when we go out into the community, especially to the schools, we get questions like, so why should we care about orchestral music? And uh, we always get teachers who are excited because we're tying music to science and we're tying music, as you said, hundreds of years ago for an instrument, tying music to history. So there is relevance today, not to mention the whole emotional component and the intangible. We don't know how music uh, affects different people. And so um, orchestral music today is just as relevant as it was 200 years ago. Um, during you know Beethoven, Mozart's time. Um, today, I think one of the uh, ways that we engage with an audience is not just sitting in an audience and the orchestra is on stage uh, and we're watching uh, a live symphony orchestra. It is engaging the audience, whether it is a small ensemble in the schools, um, having the kids tap out rhythms, being this far away from the ensemble so that they can see the instruments and learn more about the instruments. Even in a large, a full orchestra experience, you can still engage the audience in you know, multimedia. Um, we are having an Americana band. It is a new experience to have a folk band, an Americana band with symphony orchestras. So symphony orchestras today, in many ways, uh, are reinventing themselves to appeal to a broader audience, whether it's a three-year-old or an octogenarian, whether it's someone who enjoys folk music or someone who enjoys rock music, or maybe it's uh, a full, you know, movie on the screen with the full symphony orchestra playing that movie soundtrack, uh, this engages an audience in new ways during this time period. One of the things that I think is so interesting is the instruments themselves are an unmediated experience of human breath, human uh, rhythm, uh, the physicality of the, of, of the in the moment performance with all of its imperfections, if we could just get people to um, to experience that in in such an intimate way, almost as intimate as a listener as as it is for the performer to perform, it is such a joyful experience, isn't it? It is an experience and, and a joyful experience. We have an education outreach program called the Instrument Petting Zoo. And so a lot of people say, why do you, why do you use that name? No, it's not goats and cows and, and chickens and that kind of thing. But we bring a broad range of symphonic instruments. From, and you get to touch. You get to touch. And we have found um, one of uh, my past experiences uh, as far as uh, career is I was a band director. And when you're a band director, when you're testing um, kids on instruments for, to join band, they are probably 10 and 11 years old. We have experienced with our instrument petting zoo, we've gone into preschools, we've gone to libraries, and children as young as three years old can form an embouchure, make a buzz, play in a trumpet, play a clarinet, play a flute. Um, and as you have mentioned, the joy that they show on their faces when they get to not only touch the instrument, but they have made a sound out of that instrument. It is truly amazing to see these, these itty bitties, these three-year-olds making sounds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. And then we couple it with a book reading, uh, a book on music. So this uh, particular season, we had John Lithgow's Never Play Music right next to the zoo. And so they experience this book reading, they learn about instruments in a really fun and engaging way. And then they get to try these instruments. They actually get to touch and play these instruments. And we 
arguably the instrument petting zoo, the feedback that we receive, it is the most engaging and um, easiest to reach the community. We get so much positive feedback. We get teachers and directors from daycare centers saying, we had a four-year-old come up and you know, say, um, you know, the dad has come back or the mom has come back and said that they want lessons at age four which is, you know, other than piano and possibly guitar, that's generally unheard of, you know, Suzuki, Suzuki violin maybe, but, a, you know, a trumpet, a horn, most of these children don't get to experience that until much later in life. So part of the way you talk about the symphony orchestra is really interesting. Instead of talking about the repertoire and the classical elements of, of the repertoire, and the night of the performance, you launched right into education and children and experience and intimacy, and intimacy with the performer and intimacy with the, with, with the instruments. What is the philosophy that you have surrounding the leadership of a, of a, of a symphony orchestra uh, like this and, and how you must connect with other people? So the philosophy, the vision is that live symphony orchestra concerts and a symphony orchestra is for everyone from you know preschool through 80s 90s uh, 40 year olds it's for everyone and I think um, historically speaking the symphony orchestra has been seen as just for a select few and that it is not an engaging experience necessarily um, the perception anyway is to sit in an audience and so many families think oh I can't bring my children to the symphony orchestra so the philosophy is start them young show them that they can hold and and make a sound on an instrument and then provide uh, full orchestra concerts for the community free community concerts we have currently we have three of them we have one called festival on the green that's been around for decades probably the better part of our 70 years here in this community, and we are celebrating our 70th season in this community. Um, we also have a free concert at Minatrista Cultural Center um, where that draws sort of an end of the summer, come join us as we get ready for the school year, free concert for the community. And then first Thursday in October, Arts Walk is a free concert for the community downtown. So we see uh, the community a more diverse population coming through and looking at arts and seeing performances and so they can come and see a symphony orchestra for the very first time for free so we go from you know showing them what the instruments are like to mom and dad I want to see what a full orchestra looks like free and then you know maybe they want to come to some of our ticketed concerts where they can come into a venue like Emmons Auditorium where we perform most of our concerts and sit and you know witness a live symphony orchestra concert and I think this is essential actually um, critical to the growth and sustainability of any arts organization but specifically you know an orchestra. How many um, performances do you have in a year usually? We usually have about one a month, and that's a mixture of free community concerts and ticketed concerts. Mm -hmm. uh, so July, we don't typically have a concert. And then on top of that, we have weekly visits to the community with the Instrument Petting Zoo, the book reading, the small ensembles that go to the schools. We have brass quintet, wind quintet, string quartet, and um, sometimes the percussion, the marimba ensemble goes out. Um, the First three ensembles are in partnership with School of Music, so it's it's really neat to um, it's an immersive learning experience for the Ball State students to get out into the community and to learn more. Um, in addition, we do uh, workshops and activities uh, with some of the community um, community centers. We've had something called the Bucket Ensemble, where we've taken. Uh, plastic paint cans and inverted them and taken snare sticks and mm -hmm. we go there after school and we teach basic rhythm and so um, chamber music concerts we go to the uh, Westminster Village which is an assistant living um, a lot of our longtime season ticket holders live there now and so we bring chamber concerts we're bringing a harp duo to them on Wonderful. March the first um, we again we've just 
we had the marimbas go there at, at the holidays. Uh, so we're trying to reach all ages and um, get out into the community anywhere that, that we're welcome and that people would like to see us and get a lot of positive feedback. From and that. most of your, your uh, orchestra members have other jo jobs. They come from all over the, the uh, spectrum of professions. Talk about uh, uh, the types of professions that are represented in this, in this community organization, because you're also community building. Absolutely. Our third trumpet player in the Muncie Symphony Orchestra is a farmer. He came to Ball State um, over 20 years ago, got a music degree, thought that he was going to be a performer. Uh, he actually did an in-residence with a brass quintet in Kentucky, and then found himself back in Indiana farming with his father and his brother. And so he farms just north of here in Marion County, but he he's an amazing and fine trumpet player. That's his what his degree. So he you know, he performs with the Muncie Symphony, but by day he is planting and harvesting corn and soybeans. And I just saw him last week. There's um, there's a couple of uh, community orchestra, regional orchestras like Muncie Symphony. We jokingly call ourselves the I-69 Orchestra because <laughs> of the interstate that runs through. Anyway, um, Nick Manuel is um, is our uh, is his name, my colleague's name, and he said Jennifer because of all the rain. We actually just finished um, harvesting the soybeans about three weeks ago. And so, as you can imagine, during planting and harvest season, Nick's not available to come play his trumpet. So it is amazing. And for 14 years prior to becoming executive director of Muncie Symphony, I was the personnel manager and operations manager for the orchestra. And I consider it to be a huge gift for the reasons that you gave. You know, people are so fascinating and interesting. It is, it is a... It is a gift to be able to experience their lives, whether it's they're battling cancer or they just had a new baby. Um, so in addition to fascinating careers, in addition to being excellent musicians, to be uh, part of their lives and to play music alongside such amazing people. It's a terrific, terrific experience that you're providing to others and the actual participation within the symphony provides a terrific experience to its members. Jennifer Johnson, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Muncie Symphony Orchestra, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark.